I think many of us are really starting to understand that we're pretty fucked. Our future has been taken from us. It's been taken from us because of the amount of debt in the system, the action of central banks to base in currency, the problems of demographics and aging populations. It's a huge problem we all face, whether it's the retirement crisis later in life or whether it's trying to just afford to get on the ladder earlier in your career. Or many of you who are having kids, you're thinking, how the hell am I going to afford all of this? In today's video, Rel Powell, co-founder and CEO of Real Vision, talks about the latest market movement and what he learned from reading How to Save Your Future. RL talks about how tech investing is changing, how AI is changing things, how crypto will affect future wealth management strategies, and more. Without further ado, let's watch the video. Demographics and deflation. This is the thing that shapes our world. We're driven by demographic forces, and they're baked in the cake. Populations grow, populations shrink. The population of the Western world has been shrinking or has been declining in growth rates for a period of time. There are some countries with different demographics, and I've talked about that before, why India, the Middle East, and other countries are maybe a better investment opportunity than the West in many re regards. But you see, the whole thing came about from the debt demographic and deflation understanding of the world. You see, the older the population is, and the more debts that they have, the slower the trend rate of GDP growth is. And that's what creates enormous problems. And I'm trying to deal with that and let you understand what that kind of means. You see, and again, without covering all the old ground again, after World War II, we had a record amount of people born in the Western world. Those people, their journey is the story of our economy. The growth go-go years of the 50s and 60s, the inflation of the 70s driven by all of these people coming into the workforce, earning an income and competing for goods and services. Then the 80s and 90s, then the 80s was them financializing. They get to their 30s and they start buying financial assets. That starts moving the price of assets. By the time we get to the 90s, we start to bring other people into this global labor force. So not only have we got a record number of people competing for jobs, but we also then bring the WTO agreement and we start bringing everybody from China to Mexico to Vietnam into the labor force. That means that wages never really went up in real terms. Yet, because people are investing in their, in their 401ks, assets were going up. So that was the start of the great asset unbalance. What happened was over that period of time, people started taking on more and more debt to fund the difference in the asset price rises versus their wages. And that kind of makes sense. You borrow money to invest in the future. But that got out of control. By the time we got to 2008, the debt side of the equation was literally ridiculous. Every major economy was pretty close or above 100% of GDP in debt at government level. Households were at record high debts. Corporations were at record high debts. And then the world stopped. You see, what happened in 2008 was the value of the collateral of the system started falling. And that was when the equity market starts falling. The real estate market was the real one. That was huge amounts of collateral with massive amounts of borrowing. The collateral falls, the borrowing becomes unsustainable, the whole system imploded. Now, the banking system itself was record leveraged. And what happened was this complete meltdown of the global financial system. Bitcoin may already be losing steam as institutional investors pull their BTC out of the market. The latest data from sources like the UK-based investment company Faride shows that the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust lost only $170 million on March 22nd in the US. Bitcoin exchange traded funds ETFs have been getting a lot of attention for what might be the wrong reasons. This week, inflows have dropped significantly compared to the beginning of March, while outflows of Bitcoin hit all-time highs. This has led to five days in a row of net decreases in assets under management, which doesn't seem to be a coincidence. Genesis is said to have been selling its Bitcoin holdings all week. 
Should this have ended the downward pressure on the ETF? Trends could ease net flows out of the Bitcoin ETF dropped to $516 million yesterday thanks to a big drop in Bitcoin sales. Investor and businessman Lister Mill talked on X about the flow's data momentum turning the pivot point theory, which is also held by statistician Willie Wu, creator of the on-chain data resource Wubble. Back now, I now think that this really was the 1929 moment, but it didn't turn into 1929. And there was a reason for that, is we have Bernanke at the Fed. And Bernanke had an understanding of what went wrong in 1929. And he had one special trick up his sleeve, which was the use of the balance sheet of the central banks to deflate the value of money itself. And so therefore, asset prices optically rose. So that's the denominator effect you've heard me talk so much about. All the central banks agreed pretty much around the same period of time to start printing money, debasing all of fiat currency. Asset prices ripped. If asset prices ripped, well, guess what? The collateral of the system is now saved. So they save the system via this particular mechanism. Now, these are optics. They're not reality. They're optics. And I've spoken before, if you divide any of the assets since 2008 by the Fed balance sheet or global total liquidity, or any one of these measures, they've gone nowhere. You see, we've had no real growth. And that led me to start to have an understanding. It was a conversation I had with Jordi Visser. And many of you have now read The Global Macro Investor, the free one I gave out, the uh, annual think piece. And there's an incredibly important article in that, which was 2008, the year the world broke. You see, in 2008, yes, we understand that it broke, but it broke in many more ways. We hit something called peak fiat. And that's Geordie's thesis that I've stolen from him, but it really encapsulates what I'm talking about. That whole fiat currency debt-driven bubble regime died in 2008. And GDP globally fell. The trend rate of GDP growth ratcheted lower and never rose. But you see more things happened after 2008 that people aren't really aware of. For example, the dollar has been rising since then. Why? Because the dollar is the global reserve currency. Most of the global debts are in dollars. And there's a shortage of global dollars. And there has been since 2008 and really exacerbated by the time we got to the European uh, financial crisis. So there's a shortage of dollars. There's a shortage of global lenders because of Basel III and the agreements with the banking system. So the dollar rises. Okay, fine. We can deal with that. And that's part of Brent Johnson's dollar milkshake theory. But more importantly, when we look at global equity markets in dollar terms, they haven't gone up. See, here's the MSCI world. It basically hasn't gone up since 2008. When we look at, let's say, a country like Spain in Europe, Spain, I was there over that period of time. It was a terrible situation. Spanish stock market in dollars hasn't gone up. Italy, dollars, hasn't gone up. The euro stocks in dollars hasn't really gone up. The FTSE in dollars hasn't really gone up. MSCI emerging markets haven't gone up. They've gone nowhere since 2008 in dollar terms. And the same with Shanghai. So the Chinese equity market or the Bloomberg commodity market peaked back then. There's only a few markets that have outperformed this. And those are the ones that I've talked about in the past. Those were technology, crypto, and you could argue India as well, because it's different demographic cycle. But not only did equity markets peak in 2008, but we also peaked in total debts. So really what we've seen is is debt market has peaked. The US debt market peaked. In the pandemic, we had that extra spike, but really it peaked a while ago. And I've talked about this before and I'll come onto this in a bit, is, is the debt growth now is really just offsetting the interest payments. And it's all around trend rate of GDP growth. So therefore debt is not growing faster than trend rate of GDP growth, really, because 
It's the missing trend rate of GDP growth that goes into paying the interest payments, and the interest payments are where the debt growth is. Those are the deficits that we see. Mo showed a new model that compares ETF inflows with BTC price action in a recent X post. He didn't say exactly what data is used for the model, but he did say that the worst of the offflating phase might be over. According to this new model I've been playing with, the worst of the sell down in this first phase of the consolidation may be over, he said. I'm kind of expecting consolidation to go right into the halvening, which would mean more choppiness through discovery could happen by next week. This weekend, prices are likely to stay flat, and next week, prices may rise again. There are a lot of people shaking things out and waiting for lower prices. Right now, emissions are set at $644,000. We need 57.6 million inflows every day to cover the daily mined coins, this which would take less than a month. Others were harsher on Bitcoin, which now holds only half of its value. Our crypto author and educator VJ Bo Patty said on March 23rd that it was the product that caused the 2022 market collapse and that its net outflows are the biggest problem for Bitcoin right now. As a whole, spot Bitcoin products are the most successful ETF launch in history since they started trading. Cumulative flows have reached $2.15 billion. The CEO of one of the ETF providers, Kathy Wood, said that the big wave of institutional exposure is still to come. Thank you for watching.